I hope you're praying with us as we talk to you night after night. We have a great burden that the Lord would impress people and that he would be in charge. So pray for this as we go into his sacred word night after night. Our subject this evening is who, the title, who is on the loose during the millennium. The word millennium and the way it's used so freely in certain religious circles is rather amazing to me when you consider that the word is not found in the Bible at all. The word millennium, which is quite a popular word in religious circles, is not found in the Bible at all. But it simply means 1,000 years. Milli, 1,000. Enum, years. Millennium, 1,000 years. And that period is mentioned distinctly in the book of Revelation, chapter 20. And so it's all right to refer to the millennium, if you understand what you're talking about, from the Scriptures. There are some who refer to this period as a time that's coming on earth of great peace and prosperity. I've heard some interesting things. Not one shred, not one shred of scriptural evidence to support it. But I have heard that it's going to be a time right here on earth when we'll get over all of our hatred and there'll be no more war. We'll get over all our racism and everybody will get along like brothers. Beloved, that's not in the Bible at all. At all. And yet the Bible does refer to this period. This period of a thousand years. And I want us to discover it a little bit tonight. But let me begin with another point of view. First of all, the Bible has prophesied very clearly that the devil's work on earth will come to an end. Would you say amen to that? Now that's the good news. Devil myth will cease. I am happy to report tonight, in case you have not known it, that... The trouble don't last always, as the spiritual said. There will come a day when sin will cease and the devil will have to stop his work. Now, if anybody's interested to know what his work is, all you got to do is look at a newspaper or listen to the news on television or watch television. The devil's work involves billions of sex magazines and Lurid stories and articles per month which contaminate the minds of young men and women throughout this country and the world. The devil's work includes X-rated movies and nightclubs and drinking and dope peddling and ruining the youth of America with drugs. The devil's work includes crime. So weird and so heinous as to see little children ripped and torn and raped. That's the devil's work. The devil's work includes war. He delights in war, for he can sweep thousands at a time into, to into eternity without preparation. Some of them caught in the worst passions a human heart can experience. Love and violence and blood. That's the devil's work. The devil's work is responsible for the hatred that ignited in my hometown last week. Or was it this week? When the Ku Klux Klan and the Communist parties clashed and left men bleeding on the sidewalks. That's the devil's work. Are you listening to me? The devil's work includes automobile wrecks. The bodies are left mangled and throbbing on the highway. The devil's work includes what happened to our friend out here on this corner two weeks ago. The devil's work includes explosions and, and natural catastrophes and capricious acts of nature that erupt without warning and kill and slay men and women and children indiscriminately. The devil's work includes plane crashes and all these other things that are ascribed to God. That's 
the devil's work. And it keeps us tense and anxious and worried. And if you don't know Jesus, there's nowhere to rest. That's the devil's work. And I suppose his masterpiece is religious confusion. Leading people to think, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hath not spoken. That's the devil's work. But the Bible declares that one day the devil's labors will come to an end. I'm reading to you now from Revelation, the 20th chapter, and beginning with verse 1, we read these words, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, listen now, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Please try to to remember these, because we're coming back to them. Judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them which were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they, now this is another crowd, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Those who go home with Jesus, those who live and reign with Him for a thousand years, come up in the first resurrection. Now, beloved, if you have to die... That's the one you want to come up in. You want to hear the trumpet sound. You want to hear the voice of Jesus saying to the four corners of the earth, Bring forth! You want to wake up and see Christ in the clouds of heaven and go floating up in the air to meet Him. That's the first resurrection. The rest of the dead don't wake up for a thousand years. That's what the text says, verse 5. So you want to be in the first resurrection. Now on earth tonight, We are divided into more classes than we can keep up with. You've got the good-looking and the ugly. There are folk who won't even associate with you because you're not handsome. You knew that, didn't you? They have their noses in the air, and they only associate with other good-looking people. We are separated into races, you know. You've got black folks and Indians and white people and everybody wanting to stay to themselves. We are separated according to education, the ignorant and the learned. You know, there are some people who, when they proliferate a degree or two, they can't stoop to speak to a man anymore who just got through high school. You know what I mean, don't you? Uh, We have isolated and segregated and ostracized ourselves, and we've practiced exclusivism until we are divided here and there and everywhere into all kinds of groups, and we find ourselves paying homage to this kind of tradition. But, beloved, I want to tell you something tonight I hope you'll never forget as long as you live. The Lord doesn't look at folks like that. Is that clear? And we are foolish if we do. (laughs) The Lord doesn't look at people like that. He doesn't care which side of the tracks you were born on. God doesn't look at people to see what color they are, for the Bible says He is no respecter of persons. God doesn't look at people to see if they are educated or ignorant. For the Bible makes it very clear that God has hidden things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. When Jesus comes, there will be only four kinds of people on earth. How many kinds? Now this is what I want you to remember. When Jesus comes, there will be four kinds of people on earth. And four only. All these man-made divisions will be like dew before the morning sun. Christ is going to consider every 
man that ever lived. And every one of us will be in one of these four groups. What are they? First of all, he will have the righteous living. What did I say? No, this pastor, come and hold it up. This is a very simple little illustration. R.L. means righteous living. Now, there will also be on earth the righteous dead. The what? And this R.D. represents the righteous dead. That's two classes. There are only two others. They are the wicked living. And here comes W.L. representing the wicked living. And the wicked dead. Now, I, I asked them to just come and hold this a minute. We made these in a hurry. But I want you to get this picture. And I want you to repeat with me now. When Jesus comes, there will be how many classes? They are the... And the... On the other hand, there will be the... And the... And every one of us here tonight will be in one of these four groups. If you understand that, say amen. Now, there will be rich folk and poor folks, black folks and brown folks and white folks and red folks. There will be ignorant folks and learned folks all in this group. And in that group and in both these groups. There are going to be all kinds of people, but they'll all be in these four groups. Now, the sad realization is that the majority of people who've ever lived are going to be on the left hand. Would you say amen out there? The Lord says those on the right are the sheep, and those on the left are the goats. Have you ever read that? By the way, if you want to know a principal difference between a sheep and a goat, it's this. A sheep is a submissive animal. That's why the lamb represents Jesus, meek and lowly. A sheep will even go to slaughter without struggling. A goat, however, always butts. The goats are those who say, Pastor, I understand the word of the Lord, but I believe that Saturday is the Sabbath, but Lord says he's going to land them up on the left side. And on the right side will be those of all ages who loved him and did his will as best they knew his will. The majority will be wicked. Now, beloved, while these men are standing here for a moment, I want to make something very clear to you. Jesus Christ himself said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John 14, 1 to 3, would you say amen? Now, here is my proposition which I shall prove. When Jesus comes, there will be four groups on earth, and his coming will settle the issue with all four groups. When Jesus comes, he will make disposition of all four groups. Now let's prove it. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend, that means come down, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And they're going to start up to meet the Lord. Then the text goes on. Let me start all over. For God, for the Lord himself, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Let everybody who expects to go say amen. That takes care of the righteous living and the righteous dead. If you understand that, I want to see you raise your hand. I want to make sure tonight. All right. It happens just like that. When Jesus comes, how is he going to get them ready? Paul said they're going to be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, this mortal can die, shall put on immortality, can't die. And this corruptible shall put on incorruption. And Jesus is going to take the righteous dead from their graves 
the righteous living caught up together with them, they're going to meet the Lord in the air, and they're going on to heaven with Jesus. If you understand that and you want to be in that number, say amen. Now that's the righteous dead from Adam all the way down to the last saint that dies. And all the saints that are alive, that's everybody who ever lived right, Jesus is going to have them in heaven with him for a while. Would you say amen? Now that leaves two groups. Who are they? Now the wicked dead, you don't have to worry about. We've got to make some disposition of the wicked living. And I'm going to turn now to Second Thessalonians. What book did I say? And I'm going to chapter 2, and I'm going to read verse 8. And I want you to listen now. I'm trying to find this with one hand. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 8. Now listen. The Bible says. Who says? The Bible says. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. He shall do what? The wicked will be destroyed with the brightness of Christ's coming. I told you one night out here that a man cannot see God and live. The Bible says so. God is so holy, so pure, so glorious, so infinitely uh, above us, that if we simply saw him, we'd fall dead like flies. That's why even the righteous have got to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Otherwise, they can't see God. That's why Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. If you're pure in heart, if you are honest with the Lord, if you do all the truth you know to do, He judges you pure in heart, and He's going to change you. He's going to fix you, so that you can look at God and live, and then He's going to take you on to heaven. But the wicked haven't had that change, have they? So when the Lord appears, the wicked living will be destroyed with the brightness of His coming. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read you another text tonight. I believe it's on the screen. That says, when the Lord comes, the slain. What does slain mean? It says, the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth, they shall not be gathered nor lamented. Lamented means nobody's going to cry over them. Why? Ain't nobody left to cry. The righteous are all going to hell and the wicked are all dead. Wicked undertakers can't even gather them and bury them. The Bible says, therefore, they shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Now, that takes care of the wicked living. Not only leaves the wicked dead, the wicked living are destroyed. That means they're dead. And the wicked dead who'd already died stay dead. That takes care of all four classes. If you understand that, would you say amen out there? Now, John the Revelator commented on this, and he said, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Which resurrection? On such, the second death hath no power. For they shall be priests of God and shall reign with him for a thousand years. But in verse 5 he said, the rest of the dead. Who are they? The wicked dead and the wicked living who are now dead. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. So, beloved, the millennium of the Bible on earth is not an era of progress and brotherhood and no war. It is rather an era of darkness and desolation and death where the bodies of the living dead are strewn over the earth like dung, the Bible says. And the wicked who are in their graves stay in there. That's the millennium of the Bible. And they don't live again until the thousand years are finished. There's a millennium, all right. When does it start? It starts when Jesus comes and raises the righteous dead and with the righteous living gathers all his people of all ages, of all races, of all classes, of all economic brackets, the righteous who have ever walked on the earth. He takes them living and dead to heaven with him for a thousand years. The wicked are slain 
the wicked dead stay dead, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. That is a millennium of death and destruction and desolation. It is God coming down to settle the issue of sin. Now, when this period begins, figuratively, John sees the devil bound as with a chain. Bible scholars of many denominations say it is not a literal iron chain, but a chain of circumstances. Just as the war in heaven was not shooting at one another with pistols, but it was truth against error, and truth prevailed. When the devil is chained, he's chained by circumstances. Now, what are these circumstances? The devil is only effective when he's got somebody to work on. Somebody to tempt. Somebody to use. Somebody to make mistreat somebody else. The devil is only effective when he's got somebody to start a fight. Somebody to cuss. Somebody to shoot dope. Somebody to drink liquor. The devil is only effective when he's got somebody to go to these peep shows and buy these filthy magazines. The devil is only effective when he's got some old husband to beat his wife and, and somebody else to lie on a Christian. The devil is only effective using people in his devilment. But all of a sudden, there's nobody to use. Where is everybody? The saints are going to heaven and the wicked are all dead. So he's caught in circumstances where his devilment must cease. Not only that, but one day he told a lie. He said, I'm going to be God. He got kicked out of heaven for saying he was going to be God. And he came down and told Adam and Eve, if you disobey, you'll be like God. Knowing good and evil. The devil has had an obsession to be God. Now the God that I serve is different than all other gods in that he is the one who in six days created the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in the is. This distinguishes the true God from all false gods. Would you say amen? Now the Lord has made the earth desolate and without form. And the term you read in your Bible is bottomless pit. That means desolation or abyss. It means without form and void. And that's just the way it was when the Lord stepped out into nothing and spoke to nothing and said, Let there be light, and there was light. Our God made something out of nothing. Now the devil is caught in a void and desolate place. And if he is the God he said he was, let him make something now. Let him say, let there be light, and see if any light comes. Devil can't even make a flashlight. Let's say he made out there. My God is different than all other gods, because he said, let there be light, and there was. He said, let there be a sky, and let there be earth, and there was. He said, let the seas bring forth, and they did. He said, let there be birds and beasts, and there were. And then he said, let us make man, and he made him. Then he made the Sabbath as a memorial of all that. The devil has fought God and fought the Sabbath ever since. He's jealous of God's prerogatives and of the honor and worship due only to God. Now it's his chance to see what he can do. And you know what he can do? Nothing. And so he's got a thousand years to contemplate what he has done and caused. The ruin, the desolation, the destruction. It's just like getting a criminal off the street and slamming him in jail for ten years. At least you can keep the street safe for ten years. What do you say? God has bound him to this earth. He can't go flying off into space. He can only stay right here in the mess that he made. And he'll be here for a thousand years. But the Bible says after that he shall be loosed for a little seat. Well, what are the saints going to do in heaven? The Bible tells us, in, in what I just read to you, that judgment was given unto them. Would you say amen, Oh, look at here. Jesus said, if you just be faithful and stop fighting back all the time and feeling sorry for yourself, he said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Didn't Jesus say that? You know, we're so human, every time somebody mistreats us, we want to fix them, don't we? And we always giving somebody a piece of our mind. Somebody said, that's our problem. We've given away a piece here and a piece there and a piece there. Finally, we don't have any left. <laughs> the Lord says you don't have to do that. He said, be humble. Love your enemies. Try to win them to the Lord. And if you can't win them, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Would you say amen out there? 
He said, I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. One day the saints, these humble saints, by the way, some who never went to school in their lives but loved Jesus. Some of them who never had any money to amount to anything. Some of them who lived in the ghetto on the wrong side of the track. Some of them who were born in the wrong place and of the wrong race. Some of them that were always looked down on all their lives. Some of them who were mistreated and abused even in their homes. Some of them who were isolated and ostracized in their communities. Some of them that people look down their noses at year after year after year. All of a sudden, God's going to take these humble saints and set them on thrones. And he's going to put a crown on their head. And then he's going to put a book in their hand. And God's going to say, all right, you judge them. Let's say amen out there. Some of these old devils that cause you so much trouble, you're going to judge them. By the way, the record tells me that when we get to heaven, uh, you know, we're going to have this judgment. And I'd like to add what I told you the other night. There are going to be three great surprises when you get to heaven. The first surprise is that you were there. You know, I'm just being a little bit uh, humorous about it. And the second surprise, and this is serious, the second surprise is there are going to be some folk up there you thought weren't going to make it. That's why the Lord said, judge not. It's not given to us, judge. You don't know a man's heart. You don't know how to judge anybody. You don't know how they're struggling to overcome. And if you think that a man is too bad to be saved and you don't know Jesus, let's say amen out there. So don't go judging, folks. Some of these people that are making mess after mess after mess are going to get it together before it's too late. And they're going to be in heaven sitting on a throne right beside you if you get up there. Now, the third surprise is there are going to be some of these people that you looked up to all your life. They prayed so pretty, and they testified so sweet, and they walked around like the best saint on earth, but in their hearts, darkness and, and filth and disobedience and rebellion, and you thought surely they're going to be up there, and you're going to look around heaven and they're not there. And just in case you have a problem with that, you're going to say, Lord, why is it Mr. Smith up here? And the Lord will say to you, here's Mr. Smith's record. You look at it. And you're going to discover that he was a secret sinner, an adulterer, a liar, a cheater all his life. The only reason he fooled you is because he was a good hypocrite. But you can't fool God. Would you say amen or this? And the Bible tells us that saints will judge the earth. I turn to this text and then close my Bible. I'm going to turn back there again. And I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, uh, second and third verses. It says, Do ye not know that the saints, who? The saints shall judge the world. And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? We shall judge who? Listen, when the devil left heaven, one third of all the angels were kicked out too. And when we get to heaven, the good Lord is going to elevate us above angels. And we're going to sit in judgment on the devil. And I tell you, I want to be there. That old devil that, 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 that broke my heart. That old devil that nearly cut off my finger. That old devil that wrecked my car. That old devil that got me sick in the bed. That old devil that slew my loved ones. That old devil that mistreated God's people. That old devil, I want to judge him. Saints are going to judge the world. We're going to be up there living with Christ in heaven and reigning with Him. And we're going to sit in judgment with Him for a thousand years. Where is everybody else? Dead. Where are they? Scattered over the earth like dung. Their bones bleaching over the earth. God ain't in no hurry. Bible says a day with him is as a thousand years. And when we get to heaven, we're not going to be in a hurry either. The reason we're in a hurry down here is because we know we don't have long. But when we get to heaven, we got more time than we'll ever be able to even conceive of. And so we can spend a thousand years just taking it easy, getting used to being safe, overcoming heartaches. Some of us have had such a hard time down here. And, and, and we're going to get to heaven and have a thousand years just to let our wounds heal. Isn't that wonderful? A thousand years without a sneeze. A thousand years without a headache. A thousand years without eyeglasses. A thousand years without a dentist feeling in your mouth. A thousand years without taking a pill. A thousand years.
years without seeing a crash, a thousand years without seeing a crime committed, a thousand years without an accident, basking in the sunlight of the love of Jesus for a thousand years. You know what else we're going to do for a thousand years? Some of us have been mistreated down here, and some by even their loved ones. There are some husbands who've mistreated wives. There are some children who've mistreated their parents. And when you get to heaven, you'll have a thousand years to, to, to heal. The broken hearts will get straightened out. That mother that you lost, if she's saved, she'll be up there with you. That husband will be up there with you if he's a Christian. Now, for those who didn't make it, we're going to have a thousand years to get over them. Imagine a mother in heaven and a son not saved, and it's going to be like that. It's going to be a lot of that. Imagine a father and a mother in the kingdom of God, and these old bone-headed sons and daughters that wouldn't listen and wouldn't pay God any mind, they're not there. Well, they need some time to get over that. So the Lord's going to let them walk around in glory for a thousand years. They tell me time heals all wounds. And after a first year or two, you stop worrying about them so much. And by the time you get through 500 years, you don't even think about them anymore. A thousand years. That's why the Bible says God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Not going to be any crying and disappointment in heaven. A thousand years to settle down. A thousand years to stop worrying about whether you got enough to eat. Stop worrying about the, the energy crisis. A thousand years to stop worrying about Russia and, and the possibility of nuclear annihilation. A thousand years with Jesus in peace and righteousness. The old gospel writer took a view of that by faith and said, there will be peace in the valley. For me, in the sweet fields of Eden, where the tree of life is blooming, a thousand years. Oh, I just like to talk about it. A thousand years. Without a care in the world, wearing the bloom of eternal youth, I watched my sweet mother turn old and gray, and I watched her emaciated by diabetes, and I watched her finally so weak she had to be held by her daughters as she went from place to place. But always there was a smile on her face when we all get to heaven for a thousand years. Never a wrinkle or a frown. For a thousand years going to run and not be weary, going to walk and not faint for a thousand years with Jesus. Look here, I'm trying to drive a point home. Whatever you have to give up for five or ten years, whatever you have to let go for twenty or thirty years, the days of our years are three score years and ten, and if you had to give up sin, that is a pleasure for all seven years. What is that compared to a thousand years? In glory. But then, something's going to happen. After the thousand years, we're coming back down to earth. And a lot of y'all never knew that. You thought we were going to stay in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You don't belong up in heaven. The Bible says this earth was made by God to be inhabited. Now the devil temporarily thwarted God's plan. But the devil can't ultimately defeat God's purpose. Would you say amen, I say? Now, this isn't any strange doctrine. I'm going to quote something that you've quoted many times, and some of you have never realized what it meant until right now. I'm going to quote Jesus in the Beatitudes. He said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit heaven. Huh? You know, I keep misquoting Scripture, don't I? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit what? Yes, sir. God made this earth for his folks. And the devil folk seem to be in charge. They seem to have the money. They seem to have the power. They seem to have everything. But one day, Christ is going to come back down here with his folks. And he said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. Not buy on a down payment. Uh, not buy on an installment plan, not earn, but inherit. The earth going to turn it over to us. And so John said in Revelation 21, I, John, saw. I like that. That's a man who knows what he saw. 
He's not telling you what he heard, telling you what he saw. He said, I, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem. What's that? That's heaven. That's where the Lord has taken us. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. I'll come again and receive you. He said, in my Father's house of many mansions. That's the holy city. Would you say amen? But all of a sudden, John looks on in vision, and he said, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down. Doing what? Coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Zechariah the prophet tells us where it's going to land. He said he saw the Mount of Olives split in two, and it became a great plain. And the holy city lands right over there at the very spot where Jesus took off from when he looked at his disciples and said, I go to prepare a place for you. He's coming back to that same spot. And the Bible says, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Amen. John says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. When does that happen? After a thousand years. And when it comes down, something else is going to take place. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. When that period is over, the wicked dead are going to rise and they're going to be like the sands of the sea, the Bible says. You ever try to count the sand of the sea? They're going to be Millions upon millions upon millions upon millions and perhaps millions of millions of wicked folk because the crowd is going to be lost. The majority are going to go to hell. And they have been dead now for a thousand years. The Lord raises them up. This is the second resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead live not again till a thousand years are finished. When Jesus comes back down here with the holy city and all the saints on the inside, then we are told that the wicked will be raised in the second resurrection. And that's the significance of the verse that says, After the thousand years, Satan shall be loosed. Well, what bound him? The fact that he had nobody to tempt and to lead into devilment. Well, what loses him? The fact that all his folks are now alive again. He's turned loose again. And the text says immediately he goes out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth. Everybody out there is here. A lot of church members are out there. A lot of folks who thought they were Christians are out there. But along with them are the scum of the earth. The most wicked, the most mean, the most satanic, the most sadistic men that ever walked the earth. They're going to be all mixed up with these so-called Christians. And they're going to be alive. And immediately the devil is turned loose again amongst them. And the Bible says, first thing he does is try to deceive them. Well, what's he going to deceive them about? He's going to tell them, we got our last chance to take that city. This is our last chance to conquer the new Jerusalem. See all those saints in there? We outnumber them. And they do. We got our bombs. We got our guns. We got some jet planes that survived the Holocaust. Let's get all this stuff together and let's take the city. Let us march up and invade. Those saints don't have any guns. <laughs> Those saints in there don't have any airplanes. Those saints in there don't have any H-bombs. Let us go and take the... You, you think I'm fantasizing? Let me read it to you. It says here in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired... Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Verse 9, and they went up on the breast, that's the width or the bosom of the earth. They went up on the breast of the earth 
and compassed the camp of the saints about. Compass means encircle. That's what the devil always does with his armies. He encircles the enemy. It says they go up and compass the camp of the saints. What's the camp of the saints? That's the holy city that came down with all the saints in it. And Jesus is in it. His throne is in it. Would you say amen out there? You don't have to worry about the devil when you're next to Jesus. Wherever God's throne is, is safe. Now, the devil goes up and he encircles the camp. By the way, the Bible says that there's a wall around the city. And the Bible tells us how tall it is in cubits. But when you translate it into feet, that wall is about 216 feet high. And the Bible says it's made out of jasper. That's a precious stone, you know. And the Bible says not only is it 216 feet high, and not only is it made out of the precious stone called jasper, but it's also transparent. Transparent means you can see through it. That's why the Bible says, when the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Now, I want you to get a picture here as the screen begins to come down. Here are the saints inside the city, behind those jasper walls. They've been with the Lord for a thousand years. Every frown and every wrinkle erased from their faces. They wear a perpetual smile. There is peace in their eyes. Would you say amen? There's holiness everywhere. They have been away from sin for over a thousand years. They haven't seen a dirty magazine or a sorry TV program in a thousand years. There's been nothing but glory, holiness, righteousness, joy, peace for a thousand years. They don't even look like the same. But here's a son on the outside. Here's a husband on the outside. Here is somebody God tried to win, and they said, no, I'm not going to do God's will. They're on the outside. And they come running up there to the city, as the devil told them to, to take over. But when they get there, they look through the walls. Because those on the outside can see in, and those on the inside can see out. Not only are they going to get it, but they see what they're missing. And those on the inside are going to watch God settle the issue. Are you listening to me? But here comes that husband. And he's mad. The devil has given him a little pop pistol or something, you know. And he comes running up there. And when he looks through the wall, who does he see? There's his wife on the inside. She loved Jesus. She kept his commandments. She took his abuse. She watched him drunk week after week. She prayed for him and he laughed at her. But she's now inside the city. He's on the outside. And when he sees her after all this time, all the human pangs of loneliness and sentiment begin to swell up in him. And he starts crying. And he starts waving, trying to attract her attention. And she looks out to the wall at him and she smiles. And he thinks, she doesn't know me. Oh, yes, she knows him. But she says to him through the wall, I can't cry anymore. God has wiped away all tears from my eyes. I'm sorry for your husband. I tried to help you, but you wouldn't let me. I can't cry anymore. <laughs> Here is a child. Oh, we would daughter, Bob, bullheaded son. And they run up there. And they see mama. And you know how it is when you see mama. They start boohooing. Mama, mama. And mama turns and she just smiles. Oh, mama, it's us. I know who you are. Well, well why aren't you crying? I cried already. I cried for you when I was praying for you. I cried for you when you wouldn't come in for prayer. I cried for you when you wouldn't stop taking what you take. I cried for you when you wouldn't stay out of those park cars. But I can't cry anymore. Mama, why can't you cry? God has wiped away all tears from my eyes. Let me go on now and read the Bible. Bible says in verse 9, They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire. Get up there, and they're ready 
under their last deception. To try for the last time to destroy Jesus and his people. As soon as they line up, get their battalions in order. And get their guns all loaded. And get their planes all revved up. As soon as they surround the city, the Bible says the next thing is fire comes down. It comes from where? It takes care of another falsehood. That hell is down yonder. If it were, fire would come up. The Bible says when God gets ready to burn up this world, fire comes down. From God out of heaven and devours them. Revelation 20 and verse 9. Beloved, that is the end of sin. Would you say amen out there? God's people on the inside. And just like Noah's ark rode the raging destructive waters of the flood, that holy city will be a refuge. And everybody on the inside will be protected behind those jasper walls. They won't even smell the smoke, praise God. They will see wickedness and sin cut off. And the Bible says the fire is going to go out. And the wicked will be ashes under the soles of their feet. And then the gates of the city will swing open. And God will say, bring forth. And the river of the water of life will extend itself. And the water will go gushing out into an earth purified by fire. And just as he did in the beginning, Christ will say, bring forth. And there will be grass and flowers and birds. And then the Lord will say to you and me, all right, children. The meat shall inherit you. That is, when you lived in Washington, you had to pay rent all your life. The landlord harassed you. And if you ever missed your rent, you had to go through all kinds of humiliations. Now I'm giving you all the land you want. That plenty good room, it's yours because it's mine. You're joint heirs with me to everything my father owns. Go on out, children, and take yourself the spot that you want. And Isaiah said they're going to build houses and inhabit them. They're going to plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. You've got to be there, folks. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Christ will declare it is done. We gotta hurry. I got the wrong thing. Let me get the light out so I can signal my projectionist. All right, here we go. Jesus is gonna write finish to all that sin is doing and all the misery and all the destruction, all these earthquakes and hurricanes. The old Negro spiritual says, right on, King Jesus. You're coming. You're not coming as a babe in a manger, but as a conquering king. I want you to know that my Lord is not only meek and lowly, but as the old Negro spiritual says, my God is a mighty God of war. Would you say amen? He's coming down to end the Armageddon. He's coming down to settle the issue of sin. And when he comes, bless the Lord, there's going to be somebody glad to see him coming. You want to be in that number, folks? If you're dead, you want to be in the first resurrection. Not the second, but the first. You want to be in that number that shall be saved. The Bible says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him. How long? Isn't that clear? A thousand years with the Lord. I'm so glad they're going to be people of every nation, kindred, and tongue. You see a man pictured on the left side of my screen coming up out of the grave. You see him there? They're black folks, they're Indians, they're white folks, all God's children. And by the way, when you know the Lord and you are redeemed by the blood, you're brothers, no matter what color you are. And we're going to live together in kingdom. Not going to be any black side and white side in heaven. Amen? Better learn how to do it down here. Better make sure you don't hate white folks. And they better make sure they don't hate you. We can't straighten out this sinful world, but we can get straightened out, can't we? All right, we're going to heaven together. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and do what? Destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's the New Testament. The Bible says when the Lord comes, it's going to be a great earthquake. The cities of the earth shall be thrown down. 
Now, the Lord doesn't mind you having a house, but you ought to know what's going to happen to it. God doesn't mind you driving a Cadillac, but you ought to know what's going to happen to it if it doesn't wear out. Everything down here is going to be left down here except our characters. Amen. So it's all right to have it, but keep it in its proper perspective. Don't let it become more important than Jesus. Your job and everything your money buys left right here. And some will be running and screaming in terror because they didn't make any preparation. These will be destroyed by the Lord's coming. And here's that text I told you about, Jeremiah 25, 33. It says, and the slain of the Lord. Slain means killed. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented. Nobody going to weep and cry because ain't nobody around to do that. Saints are gone, wicked are dead. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried, and no undertakers alive. The undertakers that are alive are in heaven. Amen. They shall be tongue upon the ground. Powerful text. Isaiah 24, 1 and 3. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land shall be utterly empty. Yet. Do you see it, folks? Empty. Nobody. And utterly spoiled. For the Lord hath spoken this word. Jeremiah 4, 23. Jeremiah the prophet saw this and he said, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. The sun refuses to shine. Did you hear me now? Jeremiah 4, 23, uh, 24 and 25. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. Now listen to this verse. I beheld, and lo, there was no man. People talking about a thousand years of peace and brotherhood. The Bible says darkness and desolation. And there is no man. All the righteous men are in the kingdom. All the wicked are dead. There is no man. And all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. Not meaning fruit like on a tree, but meaning a place of business and progress and commerce. Wall Street and downtown Washington, including our capital center, and all the way over to Red Square in Moscow. These places that bound with human activity, they are a wilderness. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, it shall fall and not rise again. And for those whose whole life is this world, that's what we're coming to. If, if Washington is all you think about, then that's what's going to happen to it. Revelation 20 and verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. The saints are going to sit in judgment in heaven. You see, Jesus is going to gather his people, and he's going to lead them home. The old Negro spiritual says, when the saints go marching in, Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Do you agree with that? Folks, that's everything. What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Now, no artist can paint heaven. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered the heart of man. The things God is going to prepare for them that love Him. If your best imagination conjures up a picture, heaven's going to be better than that. Would you say amen out there? And while we are enjoying that, we will judge the world. Do you not know that saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, and ye, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters, know ye not that we shall judge angels? That's what we're going to be doing, amongst other things. Now, Revelation 20, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, figurative language, and he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, bound him a thousand years, cast him in the bottomless pit, and he stayed in there until the thousand years were finished, and then he'd be loose for a little season, so there is Mr. Devil, who's on the loose during the millennium, the devil and his host. By themselves, not a man alive to get in the devil, man. He's going to have a thousand years to think about what he did. A thousand years 
to prove that he's a God, if he's a God. If he can create, let him create now, because there's no light in the heavens. Let him make a sun. Let him sprinkle the skies with stars. Let him make birds and fishes and cattle. Let him say, I'll make man. He's a liar and the father of it. He's bound, therefore, with a chain of circumstances, a desolate earth, the city's broken down, darkness, no light, the wicked destroyed. All he can do is contemplate his end. He knows he has but a short time. Now, the end of the millennium will come, and eternity will begin here on earth, for the holy city comes down. Here's that text in Zechariah 14, 4, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave, that means split, in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. The mountain is getting ready for something that's coming down. What's coming down? John said, I saw it, folks. I'm telling you what I saw. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That city will come down at the end of the thousand years. And then the wicked dead are raised. Are you following? And as soon as they are raised, the devil will take leadership. I don't want to be in that resurrection. You see, when you come up in that first one, if you have to die, you're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. You're going to have a glorious body like he is. You're going to have immortality. But those folks who come up in the second resurrection, if they died with cancer, they're coming up with cancer. If they drank themselves to death, they're going to wake up drunk. If they died with a disease, a venereal disease for immorality, they're going to come up with it. They're going to come up just like they went down. And the devil is going to gather them together. And this is the second resurrection of damnation. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan is loose. He's loose because he's got some folks now to talk to and to organize. And he's going to tell them as they begin to come to life, there's that holy city and the enemy is in there. I want you all to get yourselves together. Let's find all those weapons that we used to have. Let's go down and dig up these armaments and we're going to take that city. And he deceives them into thinking they can. But the holy city that John saw has Jesus on the inside. And it has walls of transparent jasper. No devil and no enemy can violate those walls. Revelation 20 and verse 9 says, Went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city, they go up going to take the city under the leadership of the devil himself. And they are a big army. The number of them is as the sand of the sea. If you used to fall in the crowd, you'll be with the crowd then. Bible says only a few will take the straight and narrow way to life. Only a few will be willing to give up anything for Jesus. And everything for Jesus. There are some people who want to go to heaven, but they don't want to stop smoking. There are some folk who want to go to heaven, but they want to do it their way. There are some folk who want to go to heaven, but they don't want to give up movies. They don't want to give up things that corrupt good manners. Would you say amen out there? And so the crowd never has been disciplined. They're going to be on the outside looking in. If you love the crowd, there's your group. And they go up and compass the camp of the saints about. And the Bible says in the latter part of verse 9 of Revelation 20, fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. That means destroys them. Fire mixed with brimstone going to rain down from heaven. And not only is fire coming down, but the Bible declares that the chief burner is going to be the devil himself. I will destroy the old covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. Therefore will I bring forth the fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth, and never shalt thou be any more. This old false doctrine that you're going to burn forever and ever and ever, and the devil is roasting people, that was a bugaboo created to raise money during the Dark Ages. He's going to burn, and he's going to pay, but after a while he will be ashes, and he will be as though he had not been. Would you say amen out there? That lake of fire is going to be so intense that even the streams are going to burn, the Bible says. They'll burn like pits. That's tar. And if you've ever seen tar burn, you know it burns furiously. And then after the Lord has thoroughly roasted all sin, and after the Lord has thoroughly incinerated the devil himself, then he's going to reach back and he's going to grab death and hell and throw them in the fire. 
Would you say amen? That word hell comes from the word Hades, which means the grave. I'm glad that when God sets up His kingdom, we won't have any graveyards and we won't have any funerals. We won't ever have to say goodbye to Mama or Papa again. The old spiritual says, or the gospel song says, never part again. What? Never part again. Thank God. Death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. And then the Lord asks, what do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Never again. Not for ten years or a hundred years or a thousand years, but for millions upon millions upon millions of years. Never again another devil. Never again another heartache. Never again another tear. You are awfully quiet. I don't see why you aren't saying hallelujah out there tonight. Unless you don't plan to go. I'm looking forward to this. What about you? And it's for real. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of, the, of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. In what? In the new earth. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. God now has his throne in heaven. God's going to move his headquarters down to earth. God has been so intricately involved in man's affairs and in saving men. And he loves us so much. He gave his son to the human race. And Christ will always have flesh and blood. And God, because of the redemption of his saints and because of the joy he takes in our salvation, is going to move his headquarters from up there to the new Jerusalem down here on earth. And the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Now we're going out to build houses and inhabit them. But the Bible says in Isaiah 66, From one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come. Come where? Come to New Jerusalem. What are you coming for? To worship around the throne of God. And I read an inspired statement that says, Closest to the throne will be those who overcame the greatest sin. Would you say amen out there? Shows you how the mercy of God is. Some of you don't even feel like you can be saved. I got word about a man tonight. He's coming here. He's doing all the things he can to hear God's word. And yet the devil keeps telling him he can't be saved. Yes, you can. And if you're the worst sin on earth, you're going to be closest to the throne of God when Jesus sets up his kingdom. Because you're going to be special. Amen. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Oh, bless the Lord. Thank God tonight. What a mighty salvation is planned for God. You know the way some of us resist the truth, you'd think God was going to take us to heaven and throw us in jail. All of these wonderful things waiting for us. Why, good night. If you forgot the spiritual and thought of the material, you ought to want to go to heaven. If you've been short of gold down here, you're going to walk on it up there. It makes sense, doesn't it? If you've been to the hospital and carrying some kind of disease down here, you're going to live forever up there without sickness. It makes sense in dollars and cents. It pays to serve Jesus. And yet we struggle and fight and kick and wiggle and squirm. What's wrong with us? When he offers all that, I want to go. My appeals to you are simple each night. Do you want to go? How many of you appreciate tonight's message? Say amen. Look, look, look. I don't mean because C.D. Brooks did the talking. I mean because of what God has said in his word. You appreciate it. Aren't you glad to know that trouble don't last always, as the spiritual says? Aren't you glad to know it's coming to an end? Aren't you glad to know you can be with Jesus when he destroys it? Oh, bless the Lord. I want to ask you tonight. Make it is time to close, and I'm closing on time. I want you to make a decision tonight. Lord, i got to be in your kingdom with you. You can be. He's made a way. You just have to decide. Whatever it takes. Whatever adjustment has to be made in my life. And by the way, I want to clear up another uh, misconception. When you become a member of God's remnant church, you have just begun to live. 
Look here, don't you think it's hard? You never enjoyed yourself so much in all your life. That's when you get on the Lord's side. Now, that's a fact, folks, because I've been on both sides. Know what I'm talking about. Every precious thing that's happened to me has happened since I got into this truth that God is sharing with you tonight. And I'm giving that as a personal testimony. I have a friend who baptized a man out on the West Coast, and after he baptized him, he said, Now, I want you to mark off a year on your calendar. And if God fails you once, during that year, you come and tell me and we both leave in the church. Isn't that a challenge? Well, I won't tell you, you might have to be tried a little, but that's only that the goal might be refined. God will never fail His people. He'll never let you down. The Bible says, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Oh, you haven't begun to live. Don't you get some notion in your head that those who serve God sit around like sticks in the mud with nothing to do but twiddle their thumbs. That's a lie! But that ain't the best part. The best part is that in the sweet by and by, when the morning comes and all the saints of God are gathered home, in the morning, everlasting life, in the morning, reunion, with departed loved ones. In the morning, no more tears. In the morning, no more pain. In the morning, no more arthritis. In the morning, no more cancer. In the morning, no more mosquitoes. In the morning, in the morning. Yes, sir. Hallelujah, brother. God's worked it out and it's all scot free. All you got to do is believe on Him and believe in Him and believe Him. And tonight I stand before you all on the Lord's side. Who will stand with me on the Lord's side? Willing to do whatever is necessary. You might be a sinner right now, but you don't have to be after you leave here. You can stand on the Lord's side. And I want to tell you one last thing. It won't be long. No, sir. The Bible is too clear. And the Word of God has come to pass. And those things which remain, nearly all of them have to do with the ending of this world civilization. It won't be long. It won't be long. Let's pray. Lord, it's time to go home. And here we go. We beg you to see us stand and confirm our decision tonight. Oh, blessed Lord, make us thy people. We pray in Jesus' name. There is someone who cares. And the devil's work shall cease. There is someone who cares. His saints will soon know peace. There is someone who cares. Let your faith increase. For that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares. He's coming back again. There is someone who cares. He'll save your soul from sin. There is someone who cares. With him you'll live and reign. That's someone who cares. It's Jesus. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May you have a good night's rest and may tomorrow's sun find you in good health. And tomorrow night, our subject out here will be seven women for one man. And that comes out of the Bible. Don't let anything keep you away. Bring others. For God has another strong message for you, and yet a message of peace. Oh, dear Lord, bring us back safely. At that time, we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel 
in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you would discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon. <laughs> 